Uh, so today, inshallah, we're going to continue with our discussion on aruz tijara or taxing merchandise. So how we deal when we have a business, when we trade, how is it supposed to be taxed? How do we deal with it? Um, taxable items, untaxable items. And we had talked about uh, before if the zakat can be taxed in the first place, is it zakatable? And we had talked about the difference of opinion concerning that, saying that um, the, the jamhur opinion is that uh, or merchandise can be taxed and that um, the lawyers say that merchandise cannot be taxed because there's no clear text uh, concerning that. Uh, we also talked about how, it, how it's taxed and we said it's based off of the price and we even talked about how to determine price. Price can be determined either in wholesale or retail. Uh, the, the main difference being that if you sell retail, then it should be taxed at retail. If you sell wholesale, it should be taxed at wholesale. Um, but either if you're Shafi, it's taxed at wholesale regardless. Uh, do you add up all of the goods? So if my merchandise doesn't reach the Nisab, do I include all of my other assets in order for it to go up? And we said, yes, uh, this is the Hanbali opinion for sure. Uh, if we change intention, we, this is something that we left off on last time. So what happens if I have a traded good? Like, for example, if I'm a car salesman. I have cars, I decide to take one of those cars for personal use. So what happened was that my intention actually changed. It changed from a traded good to an a personal item. Does the hukum change or no? It does. Okay, it does. And what if I change my intention back? Like at one point I'm like, hey, I want to sell it now. Man, <laughs> that's when they're telling her again. Okay. And you. Ah, okay, so basically from the time that this intention happened here, I would, that would be the beginning of my new hawd. That would be the beginning of my new fiscal year. But according to the Jamhur, so anything that starts as a traded good, it depends on how it was acquired. Meaning that if it started out as a personal item, if I bought a car and then I decided to go and trade it, and then I decided again for it to be personal use. So it'd be basically the reverse of this situation, right? It would be personal item, traded good, personal item. They would say, according to this rule, would it, would it be treated, treated as generally? If, if the situation was reversed, oh, uh, it, would be it would be treated as a personal item. Say, what if I have a car dealership and I sell, buy and sell cars and I take one of them as a personal item and my intention changes with that particular car? According to this ruling, how would I deal with it? I would treat, deal with it as a traded good. So, what, what uh, Nazim mentioned, this, this is a valid opinion, right? Depending on how many times your intention changes. But in order to bring consistency, they just put, most of the madahib, they just put this rule. Like, how'd you get it, right? Or what was the intention that you had when you first acquired this item? Or what kind of business do you have? Uh, just because I'm using a car for personal item, but if I have a truck business, can the same kind of logic apply? No, right? Because this is not part of my business. It's something that's completely different. Or if I take some of the wheat and for consumption, but I have a business where I'm selling barley, right? It, you know, th these kind of things, if I have different types of things, it won't apply in those situations. Uh, so the business has to be with whatever it is that I am trading. So how's acquisition? If it's something that was active, if I actively got it, if I actively received it. Now, what is the difference between active and passive acquisition? Do you guys know? Something uh, sure. So active is something I actually go out and I seek, yeah. right? So that's something I actually go out and I buy and I purchase. Yes. Inheritance. Uh, inheritance is what? Is that active or passive? passive? That's passive. So inheritance, gifts, right? So all of these, this is a passive type of acquisition. And basically what they say is that passive acquisition is not taxable. Oh, so Except the Hamadis, because we said about the Hamadis, what? I said, we, 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 go, we go and get your money, right? <laughs> 
All <laughs> right, <laughs> the IRS learned from the Hanbalis, right? So the IRS are essentially Hanbali. You know what I mean? That's where they got a lot of their rulings from. Uh -huh, right? Because and why do they say that? Why do they say that inheritance, for example, even that is taxable? They said because you have a choice of what? Taking. Of taking it. <laughs> You don't have to take inheritance, right? You can you can give it away, or you can uh, gift it, or you can put it into a um, an endowment fund, right? There's so many things you can do. They said, but since you decided to accept it, now you're going to be taxed. Uh, so intention does not change the inherent status, right? So they're saying basically anything that is actively sought, right? So anything that is actively sought. When we're going back here, remember we were talking about acquisition. Anything that is actively sought, like if I have a car business, I actively sought those cars um, versus passive. This would be the only thing. They're saying the intention doesn't change on this. And this is agreed on, right? Most of the scholars will say that it does not matter what your intention was. And why do you think they put this or why do you think they blocked this or stopped this? Okay, sure. No problem. So, so, <laughs> So, so we said over here that there are two ways to deal with the scenario, right? One of them was, trading versus right? So we said this is traded versus personal. And we said over here, if I have a car and let's just let's stick with the car example, because I think it's easy. I have a car that I, I sell cars. I take one of the cars for personal use. Can that car be taxed or not? Yes, because the original state uh, was, it was, it was Okay, was basically that's that's what this entire discussion is, right? That's what the entire discussion is about, is that that car can continue to be taxed regardless of, of my intention. But we said that there is a valid opinion that says that when your intention changes, the taxation status also, or the tax status also changes. Babe, why do you think the scholars or the majority close that loophole? that people don't take advantage of uh, this. Whatever. So when the owner tells me about the finish, what happens? Oh, no, I'm going to use this card. I'm going to use this card to drive home, right? You know, all of a sudden, like my fiscal year is about to end. There's like a week left. Like, all right, man, I need to, I need to drop my tax status a little bit. So what can I, I need a, I need a couple write-offs, right? So what do I do? Let me use these two or three cars for personal use. Right, and, that, and that's that's what happens, and that's what's happening in that situation, which is why they close the loophole. But if why why should that loophole still be available, or why do you let's let's argue for both? When we understand, right? When when we see that it, there's a potential to be taken advantage of, there's a potential of abuse. Like, why should the loophole still remain? Who can argue that? I'm sorry. For the actual occasion. Right. There are, so there are people who actually have valid uses. Like their, their intention is not to what? Take right. Their, their intention is not to exploit. Their intention is to actually use that item. And if they're actually using it for personal use, why should that item now be taxed? So the, the active impact. So over here, it's, it's a little bit easier and it brings a little bit more consistency. And it's very clear on, on why a lot of the scholars took the position that they did concerning this. Any questions up until this point? Yeah. Um, oh, tax, when I'm talking about, I, when I say tax, I'm talking about Zika. That's it. Right. It's, it, yeah, yeah. What, what can be, what, what, basically, what is Zikatable? Right. Instead of saying Zikatable, Zikatable, Zikatable. So right? I, I just say tax book. Like it's everything. Yes. Like, like, <laughs> so the nice, the nice thing is in the Hanabula, the easy thing is simple. Everything that can be taxed uh, will, the, with the only exception of something that we would imagine or we wouldn't, is jewelry, right? So we said jewelry for personal use is not, it's not taxable. Yeah. Um, so if I get all my, I just buy a whole bunch of jewelry, saving it. If you're using it, right? Oh. If you're using it. If your intention is for it to increase in value, like, and I mean, there are certain things that, that we can actually discuss. Like, for example, if I buy a painting, what happens with paintings? NFTs, non-fungible non tokens, non-fungible tokens. What do you think? Huh? I mean, things can, things can depreciate, but the question is, okay, now I have these items that actually have value. How do I deal with those? Well, you can those for 
Ah, uh, so those are personal use. Yeah, if you, you bought them as an investment vehicle, uh -huh. as an asset. Sure. Absolutely. And, and, and I think that's a, a reasonable way to differentiate because how many of us are spending $7 million on a painting because we want to beautify our homes, right? It's, it's usually for, it's a good way of what? Of securing my money. Well, it's a better, but yeah, yeah. it's a way. Right, it is a way, right? It's a good way of securing my money. Like a lot of people, they don't spend large sums of money on things. Like there are some things, what are some things that we spend a lot of, a lot of money on that are for personal use? But it's, it, it would be considered more normal and not, nobody would be like, yeah, yeah, that's not an investment. Cars? Cars is one, right? So cars. you can get like million dollar cars, things like that. So exo exotic cars, they... I don't, I don't, I don't think the price prices do depreciate, but they don't depreciate as steeply as more economical cars. Okay, so th those wouldn't be considered an investment. Like what else? Okay, watches like really pricey, expensive watches. Not not like this one, right? So there, those would also not be considered a investment. What else? House, homes, yachts. Jets, right? These are all very, very pricey things that we normally wouldn't consider as investments and great ways to get write-offs, right? Like, you know, if you don't want to pay the cat, buy a Learjet. So they, these are ways. <laughs> so all of these are different ways to play, but, but, but there, are, there are certain things like, you know, like paintings, for example, right? Like we, we do purchase those things. But once we start opening up that door, this becomes, there are certain items that aren't taxable either, like diamonds, Right. Diamonds are not taxable goods. Topaz, amethyst, like, you know, all of these rare metals and all of these rare stones, these are not taxable. Because none of them that have say there's tax on them. But why? Because we don't have a text saying that those things can be taxed. Well, Unless what? What are some situations where those could be taxed? If I'm trading them. Right. If I'm if I'm a trader, if I'm buying and selling these things, then those would be taxed, but not on the basis of what they are. They'd be based because they are now merchandise. So why? Why this rule? Because like we had mentioned, because there's to remove those loopholes. But basically, the potential for growth is a condition of taxation. What is what does that mean? Meat. What about like meat is meat is taxable? Huh? Wheat. Okay. Why would wheat be, if I just had wheat in my silo, why would it be taxable? If I can acquire more. How do I acquire more? Okay, but here, this is a very interesting point. The item in and of itself, where at what point is it taxed? So if we talk about wheat, if we talk about barley, if we talk about rice, right? All dates. All of those are taxable items, right? All of those I have to pay Zakat on. Why do I have to pay Zakat on those? It's a trade good. I'm sorry? It's a trade good. Not because the Zakat on that we said is a different type, right? So Zakat is, you guys remember the four types? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> what are the four things, four taxable items? Gold and silver. Ah, gold and silver is the easy one. Animals. <laughs> okay, animals. Whatever comes from earth. Okay. And uh, merchandise. And merchandise. Those are. The categories. Yeah. Yeah. Are, um, for that. Products. yeah, yeah. And, and now over here, all of why? Because all of these individually have the potential to grow. Animals have the potential to what? Breed. Huh? To breed, to, to give birth. The, the, the land, right? Because it's the land and the produce that's being extracted from the land that is actually taxable. Once, once I harvest, once I harvest the wheat and I prepare it and I store it, at what point does this does the taxing happen? What at what point do I pay the cap? So there were uh, there there are stages, huh? Oh, yeah. was it like Forget that merchandise is separate, huh? Like the Number one, it has to reach a nisab, right? And it has a different nisab. It comes to osul, right? There's five osul. Is the nisab for that? Meaning, if I get five osul, and I forget, it's like what eight hundred kilos or something like that 500 no i think it's five six hundred kilos like worth of worth of goods something like that no I don't, it's not a ton the ton is more the ton, metric ton is two thousand kilos a, a regular ton is like a thousand pounds or something like that but anyway it's it's a little less than a ton basically if i harvest that much then i give what percentage uh-huh irrigated yes yeah. 
Five, 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 yeah. So if it's naturally irrigated, 10%. If it's artificially irrigated, it's 5%. So I would give five or 10% of that. Once that is removed and I put it into storage, how much of the storage is taxed? And I hold it for a year, for two years, for three years. Huh? Listen to what I'm saying. Oh, I want you guys to pay attention to that. So, so, for, so we said that once the harvest comes and I have the nislop, I give five or 10%, depending on how it's irrigated. Let's say it's artificially irrigated. I give 5% of that. So I had a thousand pounds of harvest. I give 5% of that, which is 50 pounds, right? So I take out 50 pounds. I've taken that out. The rest I put into storage. I put 950 pounds of wheat in storage. One year passes. What do I do? Uh, because I give the, the tax on the day that I harvest. That's, that's when I give zakat. It doesn't matter how long I hold it for. And the, one of the reasons that that can be taxed, like do our apples and cucumbers and these things taxed the same way? Why? Because they're perishable. So in this situation, when I have this item, non-perishable, right? I've taken out the tax for it. Once I put it in storage, that's it. It's done. I'm done. I do not need to pay tax on it again. I only pay tax every time I harvest. Every time I harvest, that's when I pay the tax. Good. So the, but why? Because there's no potential for growth in that wheat. There's no potential for growth in that barley. When does, there, when does that potential change? Same thing. I have 950 pounds of this stuff in my silo. When does the potential change for growth? The moment you cut it, cut it, cut it huh? You turn it to uh, the moment I sell it. Yeah. The moment I sell it, I have now potential for, for growth. And at that point, this is why the scholars say that now it becomes what? Taxable. Now it's a taxable item. That, do, you, do you guys understand potential for growth now? All of it or what you sell? So over here, it would be what you, it wouldn't be what you sell. It would be how much the value that you hold for a year. No, I mean, okay, say you pay the zakat 5%. Yeah. You've got 950 pounds, right? Then you decide to turn it to merchandise. Yeah. You pay zakat on what you, what you require from selling. So you're actually, you're actually double taxed in this situation. How are you double taxed? You're taxed on the harvest, 5%, and then you're taxed 2.5% of your sales. Yeah, farmers got it tough. <laughs> I mean, it applies to that in farmers. Huh? I mean, I get. I don't know who who else uh, harvests. That's different. That they're only taxed on the merchandise. They're not because they're not harvesting. Oh. It's only the farmers that are harvesting. So the farmer would be double taxed. So basically, at the at the point of harvest, he would. But how would the taxation different? The tax the taxing would be different. That I would be taxed at a thousand pounds, and then in the silo I would be taxed at nine hundred fifty. Right? Does that so like it would be, there'd be less, it would be minus that because I've already gotten taxed once. I can't be taxed twice on the same amount. I can't be taxed for a thousand pounds. Yeah. And it would be two and a half percent because now, now it's trade. Oh, it's merchandise. And we also said gold and silver, gold and silver, but even personal items, like, you know, this becomes, this becomes a real issue. Like if I have things that hold a lot of value, like paintings, NFTs, right? This is a new thing, non-fungible tokens. All of these things, some of them have a lot of value. They have a lot of value. At what point do we turn it from a, a personal item to a taxable item? When it becomes a merchant, right? It, huh. Yes. Which, which category? category? Yeah, which of these four categories would a $7 million painting fall into? Well, merchant, because you're holding it to sell it. Right, so it, it depends on... Well, yeah, on, on the attention. Yes, if you use it for personal, yes. But if you're uh, and you were intending to sell it, yeah, or I intended to pass it on to my children, whatever the case might be, right? So a lot of times people will make these purchases, assuming that what's going to happen to this painting in 20 years, right? The value is going to appreciate, right? The value is going to go up on these things. Does the same thing happen with jewelry? Yeah. To the same extent? Kind of it's it's relatively stable, right? It's relatively stable. So the potential for growth in jewelry is significantly less, less right? Which is why most of the scholars will say that there is no 
So I got on jewelry. So. Speaking of jewelry, my yeah. friend from Tajikistan, he buys his wife yeah. a lot of jewelry for this gift. Why? Why do you give it? Yeah. Because you don't understand. If we are in crisis, anytime I can go and sell, her to sell those and I can benefit from them. But if sure. I want her something really, like, yeah. Stuff, yeah, yeah, yeah. So he, like a purse. Yeah, so yeah. he buys her uh, jewelry yeah, yeah. in any case of mm. uh, financial difficulties. Yeah, yeah. So sure, like you could, using that as a hedge, right? So the thing is, there are many things that we purchase as a hedge against inflation or like a home, mm-hmm. right? A home is when people purchase homes in order to be like a hedge against inflation. Because if you look at the way that the, pro, the, the prices of houses increase, they usually increase with what? With the inflation, like with the market, like if we look at the market and, and what do I mean by that? So 20 years ago, 30 years ago, how much was a hamburger? Huh? <laughs> I mean, that's like a long time. Like, you're talking about like 50 years ago. Yeah. So like 20, 30 years ago, I can go and get a hamburger for like $3, right? Three, $4. How much is a hamburger today? Nine. It's about nine to $10. Like, did the, is the hamburger so much better now? What, is it like really five times better than it was 20 years ago? No. What happened? <laughs> well, they printed more money. That's, that's, that's definitely true. No, but I, I'm saying what happened? What happened in that time? Like the quality of meat got better. You know, they start wag you. You know what I mean? No, <laughs> that's, that's not what happened. All right. What happened? Inflation. Uh, inflation. What does inflation mean? It means the value of that dollar went. Down. It went down. Right. I cannot purchase as much with my dollar today as I could 20, 30 years ago. Right. The purchasing power actually went down. So the purchasing power actually went down. Um, And the reason I I say that is like, okay, did the house really get that much better? So if I own a home for 20 years, did the home improve in that, in that 20 years? Did, Did it really become that much more amazing? Like maybe if I lived in it. Right. But in general, if, what happens to the home? The home doesn't get better. The actual, it, it actually goes down, right? You know, so the house is actually breaking down, right? Because we're using it more. There were scratches that you put in the house that weren't there before. Like, it's not like, okay, I scratched the wall and the wall is going to heal, right? That, that doesn't happen. When you, when you scratch the wall, that's it. It's not, it's not going anywhere. That, that's where it's staying. If my kids walk around with a crayon, you know what I mean? Like, that's it. That crayon is going gonna, is gonna to stay right there. So with use, the actual... Inherent, like we would imagine the more I use something, what happens to the value of that thing? Okay. Right? It deteriorates. It goes down. Like, but the opposite happens with homes. Yes, go ahead. Right now, it's like land to build a home. Huh. Like Perfect. For like a development. So there's khilaf. There's khilaf in that situation. So if I buy a home, land for development, we said that there are multiple ways of dealing with that. I can either purchase that land for development and I would pay zakat on the value of that land every year. Or what is the other opinion? It's not compatible in the first place. Okay. If it's an investment, yeah, it's a, right? It's, it's an investment, so. right? Because I'm purchasing that land because I want to, de- not, not, I'm going to use it to develop, to pull it, put a shopping center on, and then I'm going to sell it, or I'm going to put townhouses, or I'm going to put a housing complex, whatever. I'm purchasing to use it for that, and then I'm going to sell it. When and how do I give the cow on that? Well, we it, and then we sell it. At the, at the point of purchase and the point of sale? Yeah. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Okay. So one reasonable scenario is we say we, we, get, ta- we get taxed every year, right? Um, and we, that is an opinion that basically you would get taxed every year. And when do you pay the tax? So the Shafis, they say you pay it during. The other method, what do they say? Uh, at the time of sale. At the time so of sale, ha! Huh, it accrues, and at the time of sale, you pay you pay a lump, right? And the Malikis, what would they say? There's only one opinion left. Okay. No, last I'm coming. Ah, <laughs> huh, I'll just for the last year. So, so basically, they treat it similar to how we treat harvest, right? Because you're you're putting the investment into the land, and when is the harvest? At the time of sale. Obviously, you don't you don't pay like ten percent. <laughs> you still pay the two and a half percent because it would be considered merchandise. But you don't actually see the fruits of anything. There's no building, right? There's no there's no value. There's no inherent value. I have money that's actually tied up in this. So they will say at the time of sale is when you pay the zakat. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah
And they, these are these are generally the three different opinions. All right. So every year at the time of sale. At the at the time of sale, and you back pay taxes. Okay. So there's a yearly you pay it even if you even if you haven't sold it, and then there's yearly payments that are due at the time of sale, and then there's just due at the time of sale. So are you paying for the value of where you built the house or the house itself? So it depends. The house is for what? If it's for personal use, right? Then you wouldn't be taxed on anything. If I'm using it to sell, like if I buy a piece of property and I build a house on it and I'm using all of this for personal use, then I'm not gonna be taxed on that. What if I purchase a property and I build, and I build my apartment and then below it, I build a store? Your own store? My store. It's like you use a business. <laughs> <laughs> you, 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 you pay tax all on your merchandise or on your property. Uh, right, I, st I still wouldn't be, I wouldn't be taxed on the building, even though the building's being used for what? For business. For business, right? The building's using, being used for business purposes, but I'm not gonna be taxed on that. I'm going to be taxed on the merchandise. At what point would I pay tax, if any, on that, on the building? The whole at, at, at the time of sale. sale. Okay. Awesome. Any questions? Did I confuse you guys enough or no? A little bit more confusion? All right, here. A, 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 fact, a factory. How much is a factory? Is it sloppy turbo tax? So what's interesting is that they actually have come up with the cat calculators. And you can actually put in the value for the different... Uh, assets that you own and it'll help you determine how much the cat you're supposed to pay okay yeah there, i think there's a link for, for one uh, that that they've shared so that's one and there's i mean there's a number of them like factories are factories the catable or no factory, yeah yeah no. they're const constantly producing goods for you huh? no. but isn't there there's growth right there <laughs> So, so, so the land and the building <laughs> and the goods is taxable, right? They're all three separate. I don't know. I'm asking. I think it's Yeah. And he distinguished between manufacturer and yeah. So trading companies would be the catalog. Yeah. But manufacturers, uh, the idea was that. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, he's like, cause he's like, what about what if it's wholesale or you know, like it's just the tax. It would just be on the pricing. Would it, oh, you would you be taxed at the retail or the wholesale price? Used. Yeah, yeah. Like, would you be at the wholesale or the retail price? Right. That's that's another discussion. But basically, if it's for manufacturing, you're using that space to build, right? That, does it make sense to tax the space, or does it make sense to tax the item? Right. The, the place doesn't really make too much sense. Right. There's there's a lot of money that goes into that machinery. If you're going to sell it. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Right. If you're going to sell it, it makes sense. But you you're using it to produce. Right. You're using it to produce. It's just like saying, OK, well, if I make shirts, if I make shirts and I have a sewing machine, should I be taxed on the sewing machine? Uh, right. It, it, it doesn't make sense. Right. And this is the factory. Just imagine the factory is a giant sewing machine. Right. <laughs> the only difference is it takes up a lot more space. Um, for, yeah, I, th I think that's, oh, that's good, yeah. Uh, yes, actually, because the, the next section is Zakat al Fitr, and before we go to Zakat al Fitr, I wanted to close up some of the discussion on Slack. I didn't, I forgot to make the slides for it though. So, no, you know what? I do, no, you know what? I do touch on it. It's, it's not, it's gonna, after Zakat al Fitr, inshallah, we'll talk a little bit more about, we'll talk about stocks, we'll talk about 401ks, we'll talk about investment plans, and it, we'll talk about a few things. Well, so. My question is about, yeah, if company, in fact, that still generates profit, and those profits uh, raise my stock price. Yeah. Steel. Yeah. But if you don't pay, he, if, on factory stock. Yeah, so basically what's going to happen is you, the difference comes in on what type of investment that is. If it if it's a locked in long term investment, yes, long right? Term, yes. Like that's where the difference comes in. But normally, I would pay. I would continue paying on the value. If, you're trading, if I'm actively, tra if I'm active trading. If I'm long term yeah. investment investor. Yeah. Long long term in an investment plan that I don't have access. Um, that's why he, that's why he differentiates. But e even that, I'm I'm a bit I'm a bit iffy on. 
I'm a bit iffy on that. It's why you're only taxed on the cash portion that the company holds versus the actual value. I'm, I'm st I still need a little more clarification on that. That because that's not clear to me. Like why I, why would I only be taxed on the cash portion that the company holds? Then you have to uh, figure out how much uh, share shareholder you have. have. Then you yes. Take the cash and you Absolutely. Your but share yes. Yeah. That as if you hold that. And and we'll, and we'll t yeah. So okay. so we'll, we we will talk about it. And I understand some of the reasoning behind it. But for for me, like having the value, having ownership, having how to establish ownership and the ability to use that, all of these play a role. And this is why you'll have a difference of opinion. But we're gonna, we'll talk about Zakat and Fitr real quick, and then we'll get into more discussions on how to actually give the Zakat. Uh, so who has to give Zakat and Fitr? And what is Zakat and Fitr? You guys know? What is it? Everybody's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Nobody's giving me an answer. It's the for Eid al-Fitr, right? It's basically the zakat you give for Eid al-Fitr. How is it different from regular zakat? How is it different from zakat al mad Okay. They, right? It, this has an effect on your fast, and zakat al mad has an effect on your wealth, right? Um, and the way that zakat al-Fitr is given, is it the same way that zakat al mad is given? Is it a percentage, or is it a fixed amount? Stop. Right, it's a fixed amount, right, it's a fixed amount. So basically it's an obligation on everyone who has enough, this is how they determine the obligation. Most people, a vast majority of people will give zakat al-fitr and even some of the people who give zakat al-fitr, they're also eligible to, to, re to receive it. It's really interesting. But basically how the, the Hanbalis define it, they say that it is the person who has enough food on the day of Eid, meaning from Maghrib to Maghrib. Once Ramadan ends, Maghrib starts, until Maghrib, if that person has enough food for that time, he or she is obligated now to give the al fitr. If that's the only food I have, then I am also what? Eligible to receive it. <laughs> so I would give food and I would also be in a position to take, uh, to take food. That, the Ahnaf, they, they differed saying that, oh, it is only people who hold Nisab who have to give it. If you do not hold Nisab, you are not obligated to give Zakat al-Fitr. Um, and who else, who do you give it for? You give it on all dependents. What is a dependent? Basically anybody who relies on you financially. So me as a father, as a husband, who would I give Zakat al-Fitr on behalf of? I would give it on behalf of my wife and children. Even though my wife has her own money, even though my wife has her uh, own holdings, I, because I am still considered the head of household, would give the zakat on her behalf. Um, how do you define who the head of the household is? There's a difference of opinion, like many things. Basically, the most expansive network is who? What do you guys think based on our discussions? Huh? No, no, which of the madahib? Who, who makes the family biggest in this situation? So, so basically, it, how do I define family? What is the smallest I can define my family as? My immediate family. What is immediate family? Directly, you know, wife and kids. Oh, wife and kids. Wife and kids. Maybe if I want to extend it a little bit, my parents, right? So that would be considered my immediate family. And that smallest circle is who the Madakia talk about. They say your kids and your parents. That's it. These are the people who you are directly responsible for. And as, as a man, you would also be responsible for? For your wife. Extended family, basically the, the Hanbalis, uh, the Hanafis and the Hanbalis, they make the family the largest. They say anybody who is eligible to inherit from you, even if they don't inherit at the time, if they fall under the eligibility category, they are now also considered part of your family. This makes the network very large. And it can mean that basically anybody who is rich in the family, he has to what? He has to give for anybody who cannot give in the family. You guys, does that make sense? This doesn't, if I'm independent, does my brother have to give on my behalf, even in the madhab? If I'm financially independent, does he have to give on my behalf? Can I push him and be like, nah, bro, you got to take care of this for me? Huh? No. Why? because I'm financially independent. If I was dependent, like if he was taking, if he was actually taking care of me, 
Because in the med I could go to him and be like, hey, bro, I'm poor. Med says you got to take care of me. Like he's enabling me? Oh, that's a tough one. But even in that situation, he'd still pay on your behalf. Like if he's already at that point where he's enabling you, it's like giving zakat to fitzer, it's not going to be a big deal for him. It's like, he's like, all right, yeah, you, know you want me to give 10 bucks on your behalf? Yeah, bro, we'll go ahead, no problem. So uh, the, the Shafi'iya, they say basically it's al aba wa in alaw wal abna in nazar. Yani the fathers, meaning that generation and above, and the children and below. So parents and grandparents, children and grandchildren. These are considered your family. These are considered your family. It's going to be paternal. Well, no, it's not. I'm sorry. It would be your parents on either side. Yes. Let's say you have a son and a daughter. Yeah. So they don't get married. Uh-huh. They they're independent. They're, yeah. They're not independent. They're not. They're still, they're still living with you and you're still paying for them. Yeah. You would, you would give it on their behalf. Yes. Why? Because you're responsible for them. Because they're, they're not independent. They can't. Um, when, did, when is it given? There is a difference of opinion. Um, basically, basically, there's an agreement that the obligation begins on the night of eight. That is when the obligation is like this. At that point, you have to take it out. This is an agreement. Are there other times where you can give it, where it's permissible too? Yes, you can give it before at any time. If I, like according to Ahnaf, even today, I'm preparing for the coming eight. I can give it now. It's not a problem. And we'll talk about why it's okay for them. Uh, the beginning of Ramadan, the Shafi'iyah say, as, so, as soon as the, the moon of Ramadan is seen, you can go ahead and give it and take care of it. The, the Malikiyah and the Hanabidah, they say three days prior to Eid is the maximum. And this is based on the hadith of Abdullah ibn Umar, where he said that a few days before the Eid, we would actually take out the Zakatul Fitr. There's no most correct. There's differences. That's it. I always... I'm always puzzled by this. And the most correct. Yeah. No, no. No, that's cool. Uh -huh. So I was going to say, yeah, I can say the most correct. But when I say the most correct, what does that mean? Yeah. That it is. No. <laughs> no. When I say something is the most correct, what does that actually mean? It is the most correct, too? According to me, right? Like if I'm saying, and this is the most correct opinion, that is the most correct opinion, in my opinion. Very honestly. Um, what is right? I don't, you know what I mean? Like, I, I think all of them have, have valid points and we'll talk about some of the reasons for this. This one, just, Ibn Umar, he took out, uh, the Zakat al-Fitr three days before the eight. What does that tell us? What can I extrapolate from that? Okay. Huh? Prepare. Prepare. Okay. No, I'm saying like from a ruling, ruling wise, what can I take from this? All right, that's what he did. Number one, that's his personal ishtihad. And, and the Prophet allowed it because it was done in front of him. What else? Can I, can, I, can I take an obligation from that? Can I take a limitation from that? Or can I take a recommendation from it? I can take a recommendation. The Shafi'is will say, okay, we, we see your hadith. Like, we recognize it. But that just means that's the recommended time. It actually means that since it's permissible to give it before Eid, what does that mean? I can give it at any time during Ramadan. Because essentially, when is this being given? Four years. But in what month? It's being given in Ramadan. So if you can do it three days before, what's the problem with a week? What's the problem with two weeks? It's still going to be in Ramadan. Over here, they're going to respond and say, okay, well, the purpose is getting the money and getting the foods to who? The people on the day of Eid. When you give it is what? Is irrelevant. Because the point is what? That the people get it on the Eid day. Does that make sense? You can say that this might be the safest one, right? Because this has happened in front of the Prophet Sallallahu But this doesn't negate like the permissibility of these convenience sometimes. Like, you know, a lot of these things, they, they come into play. But... All of these can be very easily justified. Um, when does it stop? And this is by agreement, by the way. You, ha you have some uh, modern scholars who will say when that they'll take the hadith literally and they'll say, when do you stop giving it? Or when is it not acceptable? 
No, no, that's that you're talking. You're, you're thinking about Eid al Adha. You're, you're confusing the two Eids. No, the end time. We're not talking about the beginning time. This is when is the last time I can give it? At what point do I give it? And now they'll be like, sorry, this isn't fit, uh, Zakat al Fitr anymore. Huh? Ah, uh, Ahsant. Right? That's the Jamhur opinion. That once Maghrib comes, it is not permissible to do that. But there are a number of people who take the hadith literally saying when the Prophet ﷺ said that anybody who gives it after the salah, it is considered sadaqa. Right? It's a very clear hadith. But none of these, none of the madahib saw that. None of the madahib agreed with the literal. This was meant to be for them a what? What do you think? They're taking the statement of the Prophet ﷺ and they're saying like, no, you still have it till the end of the day. How can they just, how can they just uh, dismiss what the Prophet ﷺ said? Context. Uh, context, ahsent. Right? We had spoken about this before. When you have a clear hadith, like quote unquote clear, right? It's, it's a very famous charge term that a lot of people like using. When you have a clear hadith where the Prophet is dictating something or putting a timeline behind something, how can you go against that timeline? By context. So, what is the context do you think that they used? What are some things that we can think of? Number one is we have supporting our other hadith. Where the Prophet some distribute, you have narrations of him actually distributing after the prayer and giving after the prayer. So, what does that tell us about what he said? What did he mean? You, sh you, you should do it. That it's a recommendation. It's the best time to give it is when? Ah, before the soul. But it is permissible to give it until the end of the read day. Uh, so I mean that it would be general charity. It wouldn't be considered zakat al fitr. Like basically, you would not have fulfilled your obligation. Would he be sinful? He would be uh, if he or, yes, because it's an obligation, right? This is for giving late. Yeah, yeah, for giving it late. Okay. So yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like he would be rewarded for what he did for the sadaqah, but he would be there would be a sin on him for not fulfilling his obligation. Okay. How much do we give? Uh, we had said that it is one sa. Sa is a like it is for amdad. So this is a med. So this is how they used to measure. What kind of weight measure is this? Is this a measure of weight or of volume? volume? This is volume. So what they would do is they would just take out right four of these. Four of these is equal to one sa. And this is approximately two and a half liters, more or less. And why do I say that? Because different items have different weights. A handful of dates is not equal to a handful of rice, is not equal to a handful of anything, right? You know what I mean? Like there, all of these, 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 uh, these items have different weights, which is why you have different organizations grading these on different prices, right? When we go to pay Zakat and Fitr, it's not like, I mean, it, it's been $10, but like slowly it's like inflation, right? So now it's like 11, 12, $13. The price is slowly going up as time goes on. How is it given? It, you have a difference of opinion on how it's supposed to be given. You have some of the madahib who specify, who specify certain types of uh, non-perishable items. Some of them will say you can only give wheat, barley, grain, uh, etc. Some of them expand on that, say anything that's non-perishable. Some of them expand on it even further, saying that any food stuff. Some of them expand on it any anything that is edible, right? And some of them, like the ahnaf, they say that you can even go expand beyond that and say even in value. So even if you want to give money, then it's okay. And the reason he says that is he said, look, look at zakat. He says zakat al mal. You can exchange all of the things. Like if you have an animal you have to give a certain type of animal or you can exchange that animal. Or if you don't even have that animal, you can give the value of that. So he's saying the same thing applies here. And this is why you have his, the ruling in which he gives that. Uh, so who do you give it to? The organizations. I'll pause here. Uh, so who do you give it to? You give it to organizations. So basically the organization, the, they act as an agent for both the, the one who's giving and the one who is 
receiving, right? So it acts as a agent for both of them. So once I give my zakatul fitr to the organization, I have fulfilled my obligation, regard, regardless of when they give it, regardless of when they give it. So even if they delay giving it, because they're the agent for the poor, right? They're agent for the giver and they're the agent for the poor. Once I give it to them, my obligation is fulfilled. Even if they give the, the zakat al fitr when? After right after Eid. Even if they give it after Eid, why? Because they are acting at, for in the, they're acting for the poor. Because they're acting for the poor. They're, they're their agent. Um, who do we give zakat al fitr to? Uh, there's basically the jamhur. They say that the eight categories, who are, the eight categories are the poor, the needy, the traveler, right? You know, I mean, the muallif al those individuals who are inclined toward Islam, etc. right? The eight categories that are famous in the ayah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, inna masudukat lil fuqara lil musakeen to the end of the ayah. Um, and the Malikiyah, they say it is for the needy and the poor only. These two categories are the ones that are specified for zakat al-fitr. They say it is different from zakat al-mal. Um, next week, inshallah. Yes. Oh, in, uh, I, I actually put this wrong. Basically, uh, in, in kind, meaning that any type of food. Uh, even Ibn Qayyim, who's Ibn Taymiyyah student, he said, even if you give any food, it doesn't, even if you give meat, like, so if you give two and a half kilos of meat, then that's fine. Yeah, that's reasonable. Like, so again, the, the circle gets more and more expansive. You have like very limited, uh, you know, limit to five or six categories. Then you have those who say anything that's non-perishable. Then you have any who say any food. And then you have those who say even in value, even if you want to give money, it's fine. Uh, and these are, this is the last thing, you know, to who it's supposed to be given to. And uh, yeah, uh, any questions on this? I think and then next week, inshallah, we'll start to how to pay zakat, uh, when it's due, how it's due, and how to give it, inshallah. Uh, we'll stop here. Uh, there's, there's no Tezkiya class uh, this week and probably next week also. All of, the, um, all of the material I've been able to use so far, a lot of it has been translated already. So it's easy for me when I don't understand something, I can go back to the Arabic to, to check. Now only the Arabic is available. <laughs> so I actually have to actively translate it myself and prepare the slides for it, which is going to take significantly longer, uh, which is why I have to put the class on pause for a couple of weeks. But inshallah, I will, I will definitely get back to it and we will start it again. I'll, I'll let Ramsha know uh, when we're starting class again, inshallah, and then she will uh, make an announcement in the group. But this at least uh, this week and next week, I probably won't be having class. If I move relatively quickly, I might be able to get the next week's class ready. But like I said, I'll let Ramsha know. There, most likely, I, I won't be able to. The fifth class will continue, though, inshallah. The fifth class will continue. Uh, also, we're offering a new set of classes um, that should should be starting in our, the first week of October. And uh, Ramsha will share the link also in the WhatsApp group, so you guys can go ahead and check that out, inshallah. Uh, any questions uh, related to what we discussed today? No? Plus, I will see all of you next week then, inshallah. Subhanallah, alhamdulillah, wish Allah not to stop the water. Yeah. For the? Yeah, for the shaheed. So, what other questions I have is that they die. Well, I don't know. I, I really, unfortunately, I don't have an answer for that one. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. So you have different situations where the Prophet said, and the one who dies like this or the one who dies in the state, he's counted from the shuhada. It's a praise of that person. They're not actually considered a shaheed, right? It's like you still have to wash the body, you know, you still have to shroud them, you have to do all those things. With the shaheed, you don't do any of those things. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he, was, he, didn't, he wasn't he active. Was yes. Absolutely. Any other questions? Salah's in about Salah's in about ten minutes. Well, I will see.